It's my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Jules Algemal from Salt Lake City in Utah, who was uh, one of the uh, early adopters uh, of ablation in the United States. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm excited to be with you virtually to discuss hyperfunctioning thyroid nodule ablation. My name is Jules Algemal. I'm the current president of the North American Society of Interventional Endocrinologists. I do not have any relevant disclosure to this presentation. My agenda today is to review the epidemiology of autonomously functioning thyroid nodule and its clinical presentation. I would like to describe the use of RFA in treatment of autonomously functioning thyroid nodule, report unpublished outcome of treatment of FTN from our current multicenter study, and last, I would like to discuss the current guidelines for thermal ablation for treatment of AFTN. What I will not be discussing today, ethanol ablation, or extensively other thermal ablation technique other than RFA. Thyroid nodules are common and can be detected on physical exam in up to 6% of women compared to 1.5% in men. When imaging study is used, this prevalence increased to up to 80%. Incidence of thyroid nodule increase with older age and with iodine deficiency. Up to 10% of all thyroid nodules are non-toxic FDN. And usually they are a result of monoclonal expansion of thyroid cells due to activating mutation in TSH receptor gene, and less commonly due to mutation in stimulating G-alpha protein gene. 10 to 20% of all non-toxic FDN will become toxic over time. Toxic FTN or toxic adenoma are responsible for 10% of all cases of hyperthyroidism and their incidence increase with older age and iodine deficiency. In a study from France that examined symptoms and signs in 1,572 patients diagnosed with hyperthyroidism using a standardized questionnaire, 69 patients had toxic FTN. 65% of patients with AFTN had biochemical subclinical hyperthyroidism. In patients with toxic adenoma, as you can see, so almost 71% of those patients had palpitation and 53% had tachycardia. Almost half of those patients complained about fatigue and 40% had unintentional weight loss. Up till recently, it was accepted that toxic AFDN are not common in nodule with average diameter less than 2.5 centimeter. But a recent study by Gondan and colleague looked into that. They evaluated 32 patients with a single AFDN that was dominantly solid and confirmed with thyroid take and scan. They observed that FDN with volumes as small as 0.8 cc were associated with TSH suppression and concluded that toxic AFDN can occur at any thyroid nodule size. They also noted that TSH level was below the normal range in all nodules larger than 4.9 cc. Based on this observation of toxic adenoma can be very small, one can conclude when treating toxic AFDN with thermal ablation that volume reduction can be a good predictor to success but only complete ablation of toxic adenoma can achieve 100% success. <clears throat> when we think about ablation technique and try to compare, there is really no head-to-head -head study comparing different thermal and chemical ablation. But as I mentioned before, complete destruction of toxic adenoma is essential. And when we think about chemical ablation, a question always rises how controlled the treatment is. And when we think about thermal ablation, one can argue that technology that allows freedom for experienced operator to achieve thermal ablation, including the margin, may yield superior outcome. What is the evaluation before treatment for AFDN? All nodules should be evaluated with fine needle aspiration except mainly in spongy form nodules that are small. All patients should get a thyroid uptake and scan to confirm the etiology. Also thyroid antibody for grave disease should be tested before procedure 
has positive antibody may alter treatment plan. And last, for pre the treatment with antiviral drug medication should be tailored to patient medical condition and severity of hypothyroidism. So how a typical treatment with RFA would look like? After evaluation of vocal cord movement with ultrasound and visualization of the vagus nerve, we perform in our practice lidocaine injection, a parathyroidal capsule. We do a complete vascular evaluation and mapping for the vascular flow of the nodule. This is followed by a transisthmic approach and a moving shock technique to completely ablate the thyroid nodule. And as Dr. Balkavi already mentioned, our goal is to completely have a vascular nodule at the end of the ablation. And here is an example of successful RFA treatment of toxic adenoma. In this patient, the volume initially was 4.7 cc and TSH level was 0.02. After six weeks of radiofrequency ablation, there was a 67% volume reduction, TSH level risen to 6.6. .6. At six months point, the volume reduction was 85% and TSH level was 2.69 without any medical treatment. What about our data? We have four centers participating in our multi-center study who perform radiofrequency ablation and benign thyroid nodule. 50 patients were treated between November 2018 and December 2021 for benign single toxic adenoma. Eight patients were lost to follow up with a total 44 patients with available data. 40 females, four males, median age was 47 years. 30 patients had solid or dominantly solid nodule, four spongy form, and two had dominantly cystic nodules. Medium volume size was 7.85 cc. Most of those nodules were benign on cytology, and three had Bethesda category three with negative genetic analysis. When we look at the outcome of volume change, there was a significant volume reduction post-treatment with one session with radiofrequency ablation with an average volume reduction of 61%, with an average follow-up of three months. When separate this sample of patient into two group, patient with toxic adenoma with less than 12 cc, there was a 28 patient with toxic adenoma with that size. Medium volume reduction after one session of radiofrequency ablation was 66%, and there was a significant increase in TSH level from a mean of 0.26 before treatment to 1.12 post-treatment with RFA, which was significant. Success rate, and we define that as normalization of thyroid function test if patient was not on treatment with autonomously with a uh, antithyroid medication, or normalizing of thyroid function test after discontinuation of treatment with antithyroid medication if patient was not on treatment before RFA, it was estimated to be 82%. There was no significant complication in this group. When we compare that to a smaller sample of patients who have toxic adenoma, it or larger than 12 cc, this group was 12 patient, medium volume reduction was 53%. There was no significant change in TSH before and after treatment in this group, and only 37% achieved successful treatment outcome as described. Again, there was no serious complication in this patient group. Our data is aligned with outcome of previous studies and treatment of toxic autonomously functioning thyroid nodule using RFA, as shown in this meta-analysis by Muhammad and Kali. It's also important to notice that in two of the last three studies, the average volume was around 7.5 cc to 8.2 cc. And with the introduction of an adoption of moving shot technique, there was a shift in success rate, as you can notice in the most recent studies. I would like here to mention one study in laser ablation for treatment of toxic adenoma. This study done by Gamblone and colleague included 82 patients. What's interesting in that study, 
that they use a form of moving shot technique using laser ablation. Also, they had multiple needles used, either one to up to four, based on the initial size of the nodule. And those patients were monitored up to three years. And as you can see, those patients have normal thyroid function tests before and up to three years after treatment. But those patients before treatment were all on treatment with methamazole, and there was a significant patient who stopped methamazole after treatment with laser ablation. When we look at the initial size of the nodule and the success of discontinuing treatment with methamazole and maintaining thyroid function as normal, you can see the largest group in this data was for patient between a volume of 5 to 15 cc. This included a 51 patient. And the success rate is equal to 90%. Based on this old information, currently in the guidelines, thermal ablation for treatment of AFDN is recommended to be considered for treatment of toxic thyroid nodule less than 10 to 15 cc. And current guidelines in general recommend against radiofrequency ablation or careful planning for treatment of toxic adenoma larger than 10 cc. This second recommendation may be driven in part by cost of surgery in Europe. As you can see here in a study published by the Dr. Kant and colleague, surgery was the most effective method of treatment of toxic thyroid nodule in Europe with estimated cost of 1,300 euros. But is that the case in the USA? The same group evaluated the cost effectiveness of different treatment and toxic thyroid nodule, and they concluded that in the USA, radioactive iodine was the least cost or the least expensive treatment with estimated cost of $3,800. And they concluded also for most patients who are younger than 60 years old, surgery was an effective strategy with reasonable cost. This improved effectiveness was equal to two months of good quality of life. In their study, they also estimated that Failure of treatment with radioactive iodine per first treatment with low dose was closer to 14.4%. Permanent hypothyroidism post-treatment was estimated to be around 7.7%, which is equal to 22% of failure of achieving eothyroidism. When we looked at they looked at high dose of radioactive iodine compared to low dose, failure of initial treatment was 7.7% and permanent hypothyroidism emerging was around 19.5%. This is also equal to 27% of failure of achieving eothyroidism. Also, they noted that estimated recurrent hyperthyroidism post-treatment or low-dose radioactive iodine was 5.5% versus 3% with high dose of radioactive iodine. Surgery, temporary dysphonia was estimated to be around 6.1%, and for hypothyroidism permanent after surgery, it was estimated around 2.3%. How does that compare to radiofrequency ablation? Based on the current available data and research, radiofrequency ablation complication of dysphonia estimated to be around 1% and being temporary. Failure of treatment based on meta-analysis data published especially in nodules smaller than 15 cc, is estimated to be around 6 to 19%. Permanent hypothyroidism is extremely rare. And then recurrent hyperthyroidism is not well defined after treatment with radiofrequency ablation. But one can argue it could not exceed regrowth post-treatment, which is estimated around 5%. By looking at this, one can argue that Radiofrequency ablation, especially in toxic adenoma smaller than 15 cc, have a better chance of achieving eothyroidism compared to low-dose radioactive iodine or high-dose radioactive iodine. 
or at least can one say it's maybe less, not inferior to those treatments. Another point that always kind of underestimated quality of life is the impact of SCAR on patient quality of life, which are not noticed when we treat with radiofrequency ablation. Last, a recent study by you and Carly looked at the cost of lupectomy versus radiofrequency ablation performed in office in the USA. And they estimated the total surgery cost was around 19,000. Office-based RFA was closer to $8,700, which really equaled that two treatment with RFA will be less expensive than one surgery. Based on all those information, Current recommendation by our society, we recommend inserting thermal ablation as a first-line treatment for benign toxic adenoma less than 12 cc, which is opposite to other recommendation by other society who only recommend that in patients who have contraindication for surgery or radioactive iodine. We also consider treatment with radiofrequency ablation for benign toxic adenoma in selected patients. In conclusion, radiofrequency ablation should could be considered a first-line treatment for autonomously functioning nodule with a volume less than 12 cc, especially when expertise is available. An absolutely complete ablation of autonomously functioning thyroid nodule using modeling shock technique and modern ablation is essential for success. Thank you. Thank you for that very clear presentation. That was great. Does anyone have any questions? I'll just hand it over to the floor for a couple of minutes. We've got, yeah. Stan's coming up to the microphone. Very clear presentation. I appreciate the overview. I have a question about the impact that you have on patients that are pre-treated with metimazole versus those that are not treated as far as very early recovery, symptoms, tachycardia, any challenges that you've seen on those that were treated when they were still thyrotoxic? So, is this question specifically about treatment of autonomously functioning nodule while on methimazole in our practice? While on versus off methimazole. I see that you've treated some patients that were still with the suppressed TSH. Did they respond clinically differently than those with new thyroid status? So the way we, we, in our practice, we monitor those patients, we generally check on those patients six weeks after. Most patients who have toxic adenoma, not on treatment with methamazole, notice improvement in symptoms generally between week three to four after the ablation, especially if the ablation is successful. So patients who are not on treatment, they feel better in three to four weeks. And six weeks, most of those patients will say significant improvement in symptoms. And patients who are on treatment on methamazole, we divide those patients into two types of patients. Patients who are on small dose of a methamazole of five milligram or patient on higher dose of methamazole. And also we divide them based on their past history. Are those patients have a medical condition that we make us worry a little bit about stopping methamazole immediately. Those patients, if we're worried, we wait. We make sure the levels of thyroid are back to normal, then we just into the treatment. For the patient who are, we're not worried about them a, from clinical point of view, or a five milligram, most of those patients, we discontinue the treatment immediately after. And they describe a similar outcome to the patient who were not on treatment with mesomazole, where they describe the improvement of symptoms between four weeks to up to six weeks. Thank you. I would mention our experience has been that very early, within the first 48 to 72 hours, patients that started with the suppressed TSH did have a higher incidence of palpitations and some of them require beta blocker therapy. So we have changed our approach to try to minimize early intervention and try to restore new thyroiditis before RFA. Just so, as a side note. Yeah, in our patient, we did not notice increase a, a symptoms of a hyperthyroidism after. As you're aware, when we're doing thermal ablation, the temperature of the tissue would increase significantly. And thyroid hormone as a protein and amino acid cannot maintain its stability with a higher level of temperature. There is some destruction of tissue surrounding the area of a, the most ablated part, 
but there is not a similar mechanism. If in anything, it's a small mechanism of destruction of tissue and release of hormone when we do radiofrequency ablation in our experience. Thank you.